I know enough to follow my heart, to follow my passion, and I hope all of you will do that and accomplish great things. So for me, my heart and my passion lead me to working with people and working with science, and I brought them together and followed the call to become a psychologist. For my first job, I worked at a residential treatment center for severely emotionally and behaviorally disturbed kids, and almost all of them had been severely physically or sexually abused. I learned so much from these young kids who had seen more in their short life than I've seen in my gentle many decades, um, and they became the reason why I was fascinated in PTSD. To be honest, their minds were so resilient and adaptive and found unique ways of protecting themselves from the horrors they'd known. I needed to know more. And I decided that I wanted to study post-traumatic stress disorder called PTSD. So I should teach you a little bit about this if you don't know yet. PTSD um, focuses on trauma. Trauma requires a life-threatening situation or injury or sexual assault. This isn't a minor bad event. This is a life-threatening or sexually traumatic event. People with PTSD have nightmares. They re-experience. They think about this when they don't want to. They might have flashbacks. They avoid people, places, things that remind them of traumatic events. They have negative moods, cognitions. They feel depressed. They feel guilty. And they have physiological arousal. They're always ready for the next shoe to drop. They're always ready and on guard and watching against the next bad thing so they don't sleep well, and they might be angry, and they're always on guard. But bottom line, PTSD is the only major psychological disorder that the cause is in the list of symptoms. PTSD is caused by trauma. And it doesn't matter what kind of trauma you experience, physical abuse, sexual assault, combat, terrorism, natural disaster, all of these traumas result in the same set of symptoms. And the traumas are experienced. They're re-experienced, they're avoided, they're guarded against, they swirl and they push and they pull in this constant dialectic of attending to danger and avoiding danger. There are great current treatments available for reducing PTSD. Talk therapy is one of those gold standard interventions, and all of them share in common a quality of exposure therapy. That means you go to counseling for PTSD, and you'll talk to your counselor in depth, in detail, in horrifying detail, about the worst day, the worst moment, the worst second of your life. And you'll do it again and again and again until it doesn't bother you so much. This is not fun therapy. It's hard. It's unpleasant, it's expensive. The other major gold standard treatment for PTSD is medication. However, there are no curative medications in PTSD. Meds only target associated symptoms like hmm, depression or sleep disturbance or maybe some anxiety. So, what do I know? Um, well, something is missing in the current treatments for PTSD. Medications are heavily prescribed, however, they don't target specific symptoms of PTSD. Gold standard talk therapy is emotionally draining for patient and provider. And clients drop out of talk therapy because it's too difficult to continue. So I decided that we didn't just need to build on existing interventions, but we needed to start over. We needed to reconceptualize the way we think about PTSD and try to treat it. So here's the idea. Simplify. Take out Occam's razor and move from a focus on symptoms down to the very core of PTSD. And that very core of PTSD is trauma. So, instead of talking about all the memories, meanings, interpretations, recollections that swirl at the top of the funnel and usually is where talk therapy works, I want to shift. And I want to pay attention to the lowest, narrowest tip of the funnel. And this is the way people pay attention how people pay attention to cues in the world that might trigger a warning sign. What do we need to look at then? We need to think about how people experience trauma and worry about re-experiencing trauma. So let's think. People are social people. People are very important to others. One of the greatest forms of threat is other people. 
So it's important for us to be able to recognize what kind of mood and intention other people have. And we tend to know that via their facial expression. Simple. First gut reaction. What do you see? A face? I think most of you are going to tell me it's a face. If you look closely, well, it's fruits and vegetables or a famous painting by Archambaldo. But really, the first thing everybody sees is a face. The major message here is that our brains are primed to see faces. And that means that faces must have an important and major significance. Look. Threatening faces pull our attention immediately. Um, it's really important for you guys to understand, brain space is high-end real estate. Our heads are only so big. So if we've got a brain space particularly designed to do a task, we know that task is important. And one such brain space is called the fusiform face area. This is the underbelly of your brain, so looking at your brain from the underside. And marked in red, you'll notice that this is the fusiform face area, and it's engaged when viewing faces. A really cool thing about our own facial recognition device in the overlay here is it's right next door to our threat processing areas. So look, the area here in red is going to be called our amygdala, part of our limbic system, and it's the part of our brain that reads threat. It reads danger. Isn't it handy that our own innate alarm system is right next door in terms of geography um, to our facial recognition area? Eh, this isn't by accident, this is by design. We look at the human brain, and what you can see here is that all of the major tracks for all the different cognitive processes we have, they all intersect at the limbic system, which contains the amygdala. And the amygdala alerts us to fear. So, um, what do we see here? Dorothy and her group of friends are going to go on a walk through the haunted forest, and they chant, lions and tigers and Bears? Oh my? Uh, wait, let's try that again. No, they chant, lions and tigers and bears. Oh my! The job of the amygdala is to read, do we have a threatening signal? And what you're seeing on the board here is research we've done locally, looking at combat veterans with PTSD against healthy combat veterans. Top row, the guys who are doing well don't have any psychological symptoms. Their brains are pretty quiet at rest. Their eyes are shut. They're resting, maybe daydreaming. The row underneath are the veterans with PTSD. Same task, eyes closed at rest. And their emotional processing areas are busy. They're daydreaming. They're having visual images. And they have a lot of activity in their threat alarm system, even though they're in a room by themselves and it's quiet and it's safe. So let's think about this from a more experiential point of view. If you're somebody with PTSD, the yellow door here on this picture, it gets all of your attention. This is like threat, OK? You worry about this door. You think about this door. You worry about what might happen behind this door. And you avoid the other doors. Or maybe you're trying to look at another door and not look at the yellow door. But you're hung up on the yellow door. <sighs> attend, avoid, attend, avoid, attend, avoid. So in my intervention, it's so simple. People see two faces at the same time on a computer screen. One's normal, one's angry. If they see an angry face and they have PTSD, the brain sounds an alarm. That's a big deal, because people without PTSD don't have this amygdala response. People with PTSD who see neutral faces don't have this alarm either. This happens only in PTSD, and it tells us that the brain responds to threat immediately and quickly. This is a bottom-up basic processing difference. We don't have time to think about it. So here's what happens over and over again in the treatment. I'll show you a face pair. It's there for half a second. It goes away. The amygdala response is 10 times faster than that. The amygdala response that tells us one of those faces is angry happens in 50 milliseconds. Let's see it. Ready? Let's see it again. How easy is it to even tell what you're seeing? We aren't looking at a higher order cognitive process here that requires the upper divisions of our brain. Really, all we're looking for is that bottom-up, immediate evolutionary response push. Let's try that here. 
You guys take a look at the screen. I only want you to look for R's. Find the letter R. Only look for R's. Where are the R's? Where are the R's? Don't look at the other letters. Don't see the other letters. Find the R's. Whew, okay. Let's try it again. Quit looking at the R's. The R's are bad. You don't need to think about them. They're threatening. They're going to remind you of your bad experience. Now I'd like you to look for the E's. Give it a shot. Don't look at the R's, whatever you do. Only find the E's. Uh, don't think about these R's. They're going to get you in trouble. E, E, E. OK. Huh. Bottom line, I hope you see a few more E's. I'm sure you're still seeing R's, and you're probably noticing very little else. So in PTSD, we need to refocus attention and take the overly threatening nature out of um, normal, everyday cues, like a piece of garbage on the side of the road that reminds the Iraq veteran of a potential explosive device. So in my intervention, we can now deliver this via computer. People see two faces, they leave the screen, an arrow comes back in place, they press right or left, and they do this 150 or so times, and that's it. No sweat, no tears, no crying. In our research, we find that if we take the special meaning of threat away, they don't have to attend or avoid, we get dramatic reductions in PTSD symptoms, and we get them so much improved that almost all of them are beneath the diagnostic threshold for this condition, which is really exciting. We also know what causes it. With a reduction in attend, avoid, attend, avoid, we get a reduction in PTSD symptoms. So we know the causal modality here as well. And we can see it in the brain. In the top row, you're seeing brain differences in activation or deactivation between healthy and combat veterans. After treatment, those differences are essentially reversed, meaning these brains now look like healthy people without PTSD. And again, the bottom of the brain, the amygdala is quiet. And also interesting, in the picture next to that, the prefrontal cortex that normally we try to activate in talk therapy, it's also quiet. Well, why? Because its job is to tone down the amygdala from a top-down model. My treatment tones it down from the bottom-up model, making it simple and easy. A tiny intervention in a tiny process can make a great difference. So in visual, let's revisit this again. After completing treatment, People with PTSD are not stuck only viewing the yellow door. Now all the doors are available. All the doors are interesting. All the doors are full of potential. And they can be opened for a healthy, happy life. So that potential trauma cue that had bothered them and thrown them into full-blown symptoms prior to treatment is just a drop. And treatment allows them to see the whole world to focus on what's important to them, and this is a great joy for me to be able to contribute to this. We're currently finishing clinical trials in hopes of being able to call this treatment, and treatment that's web deliverable, easily accessible, and almost free. In science, we usually end our talks by talking about the people who have contributed to our ideas, who, people who came before us, the giants whose shoulders we have stood upon. Well, I thank them, and I thank my collaborators, but I want you all to know that the greatest giants, the strongest giants that I have known, are the people who've had traumatic events happen to them, have shared their stories with me, and allowed me to learn from them. I thank them, and I thank you for your attention today. <laughs>